Are we ready, Lisa? All right, I've got 631. I'm Mayor Tome here to call to order this meeting of the Columbus Common Council, regular meeting for Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. Again, we're continuing to use a Zoom video conference um, to facilitate COVID-19. Uh, we have the council present here this evening with the exception of Alder Gray, who is on Zoom, uh, as well as staff. Um, with that, could you please take a roll call for us, Pat? Adams? Present. Gray? Present. McCabe? Here. Piper Rome? Present. Reed? Here. Ryan? Here. Tom? Here. All present. Thank you. If able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. This meeting has been uh, noticed in accordance with state statutes and local ordinances. The next item then is to approve the agenda for the evening. Unless there's any alterations or deletions, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda as it's presented. All the will make a motion to approve the agenda. Adam seconds. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. Is there any discussion on the motion? If none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Agenda is approved, thank you. On the correspondence and communications, we had no one signed up here uh, in person this evening, and the clerk has indicated to me that uh, there was no one that had emailed her to sign up uh, through Zoom. So we had no correspondence or communications. Is there anyone present this evening that did not get a chance to sign up that wished to speak? Seeing none, then we'll move on to the consent agenda. <clears throat> on the consent agenda, we have the Council and Committee of the Whole meeting minutes for the August 18th meeting as well as the September 1st meeting and also applications for operators licenses but I don't believe there's any listed for this. So there's no operators licenses just the meeting minutes. Unless there's any questions on the consent agenda I'll take a motion to approve as submitted. <clears throat> Adams moves to approve the consent agenda. Read seconds. All right we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion on that motion? If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda is approved. Move on to new business item number one. Number one is introduce resolution number 17-20, a resolution to vacate certain portions of West Fountain Street and South Spring Street located in the city of Columbus, Columbia County, Wisconsin, and set time for public hearing on resolution 17-20. Again, this was forwarded <clears throat> from the Committee of the Whole Review. Uh, there's a vacation that needs to <clears throat> happen since we've decided we're not gonna continue to build streets through public schools. <clears throat> so this is a process we have to go through. It's going to take some time. I believe there's a 40 day um, opportunity for feedback on the resolution. Uh, but my understanding this evening is that we would need a motion to introduce the resolution. It's not approving the resolution. And that opens up the public comment portion um, between now and the uh, public hearing. So we're going to have to do two separate motions this evening. The first is to introduce the resolution, and then also after that, a motion to set the public hearing uh, date and time. So, any questions from the council on this? If there's no further questions, I'll entertain motion to introduce resolution 17-20. All the five will make a motion to introduce resolution 17-20. Adam seconds. I have a motion and a second to introduce resolution number 17-20. Is there any discussion on the motion? If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the resolution has been introduced. Now we would need to set, we would need to, I get a motion to set the public hearing uh, for a date and time. The suggestion is November 2nd at 6.30 p.m., which would be our first regular meeting in November. Uh, we will have to change that meeting date at the next meeting um, to a Monday instead of the Tuesday. Uh, to clarify, typically our meeting would be on November 3rd, which correct. is the Tuesday, but since it's the election day, 
Um, we typically revert to Mondays as a. That's been typical. Yes. Is there any calendar conflicts from the council to move that back one day that we know of yet? <clears throat> no. All right. If there's no conflicts there, then I'd take a motion to set the public hearing for November 2nd at 6.30 p.m. <clears throat> Adams moves to set the public hearing date for November 2nd at 6.30 p.m. I'll set the... <laughs> Did we get a second, Paul? All right, we have a motion and a second to set the public hearing for November 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Is there any further discussion on that? If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? All right, the public hearing has been set. Thank you. We can move on to new business number two, which is considering take action on resolution 15-20, the exemption from the Columbia County Library tax for 2021. This is something that we do annually since we do levy local taxes for our library, which exempts us from being double taxed uh, through the county, I believe. So we did review the resolution at the Committee of the Whole. I think the resolutions are out of yeah, order in my packet anyway. So this one is for Columbia County. Are there any questions on this one from the council? If there's no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve resolution 15-20 to ex exemption from Columbia County Library tax for 2021. McCabe will make a motion to approve the resolution 15-20 exemption from Columbia County Library tax for 2021. Part from settling that. Okay, we have a motion. And a second to approve resolution 15-20. Is there any further discussion on the motion? If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. We move on to item number three, which is uh, essentially the same resolution, but for Dodge County library exemption for 2021. Are there any questions on resolution 56? Can't even read without the glasses on here. 16-20. There's no questions on the resolution. I'll entertain a motion to approve resolution 16-20. Alder Ryan, I'll make a motion to approve resolution 16-20 Dodge County Library uh, exemption for 2021. Read second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve resolution 16-20. Any further discussion on that motion? If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Move on to item number four, another resolution. Consider and take action on resolution 18-20 for the Wisconsin DNR Urban Forestry Grant. This was brought through the Committee of the Whole um, by DPW Director Zach Navin, who would like to apply for a forestry grant this year. Uh, I believe the details of the grant will be to come as the budget is developed as, as to the exact dollar amount, but the resolution needs to be approved uh, to apply. So we have that resolution in our packet. Is there any discussion or questions on resolution 18-20? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve resolution 18-20. Resolution <clears throat> Alder Gray makes a motion to approve resolution 18-20, the Wisconsin DNR Urban Forest Street Grant. All the pipe seconds. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve resolution 18-20. Is there any further discussion on that? If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? Motion passes. We move on to number five, which is consider and take action on claims in the amount of $178,277.25. Are there any questions on the claims as submitted?
I see no questions. If there's no further questions, then I'll entertain a motion to approve the claims and the amount submitted. Okay, we'll make a motion to um, accept the amount of the claim of 178277 and 25 cents. Adam seconds. Motion from McCabe, second from Adams to approve the city claims in the amount of $178,277.25. Is there any discussion on that motion? If there's no further discussion, Pat, could you take a roll call for us, please? Adams? <coughs> Aye. Gray? Aye. McCabe? Aye. Pfeiffer Rowan? Aye. Reed? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Pat. Uh, on to report of city officers. I'll turn it over to uh, City Administrator Kyle Ellefson so I can take, catch my breath. All right, thank you. Uh, just a couple quick items. Uh, the police union negotiations are coming up next week, uh, so I will be meeting along with the police chief and the union representative and uh, Pamela Fredericks as well as we uh, sort of dive into the, uh, the competing proposals that we have and try to hammer out an agreement that uh, works for both sides. Uh, advertising for the Director of Public Works will begin this week. Uh, it was delayed just a little bit with some competing uh, priorities, but uh, that will be uh, coming out shortly. Uh, this Friday, a rep from Ron Johnson's office will be uh, stopping in to visit me, so I don't know uh, what I'll have uh, to gather from that, but I'll pass along anything interesting that they share. Uh, now to the road work, which seems to be kind of ever-present right now. Uh, the seal coating finished up this week. Crack sealing is coming up next week. Uh, the mill and overlay on Waterloo Street starts tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. Uh, should be done tomorrow, uh, barring any problems. Uh, Hibbard Street continues to come along, uh, even with the rain. That did uh, slow things uh, just a little bit. Um, the sewer is essentially done on Hibbard. Uh, water is above 90% done, and uh, they'll actually be closing Dick Street tomorrow, as, or uh, not tomorrow, Thursday, excuse me, as they work to make a final connection in Dick Street. Um, storm has started, and they're about a third done with uh, the storm sewer, and they're starting to build road. Uh, so I think that's all encouraging news. Um, with some of the slowdowns with the water, though, um, we did relieve, uh, receive an early request um, to maybe work on a Saturday. Ended up with the forecasted rain. They didn't pursue working on a Saturday, but just to throw it out there that we're likely going to receive those requests, and I'll receive them and kind of evaluate uh, what they're asking. Uh, but with a slowdown in weather, I think there's a lot of people anxious to get the project done. Um, so it's likely that if it's a reasonable request, I'll be granting it and there may be some Saturday work, but we would certainly let the public know through a blast and also an email to the council. So that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, as announced at our last city council meeting, a DP director, DPW director, Zach Navin notified us that he has accepted a new position and his last day with us here in Columbus will be September 25th. As I mentioned last time, I was going to say more nice things about him this evening. So here it is. <clears throat> uh, Zach's time with us has been somewhat brief as he started employment with the city in May of 2019, but it also been a very productive time. Uh, Zach's leadership and professionalism became evident as soon as he started with us. His communication with city staff and departments helped the city accomplish the completion of several stormwater related projects by partnering with uh, Columbia County crews. Uh, Zach was also an important team member in planning for and helping manage the ongoing Hibbard Street reconstruction project. He also assisted with facilities management by helping the city oversee needed maintenance projects on city buildings like the police station facade project that has been recently completed as well as many projects at the aquatic center. Zach brought with him a very clear understanding of public policy and procedure and has helped the city move closer to the adoption of a sidewalk policy after several years of city council desire and discussion to do so. Overall, Zach brought a very positive and productive tone to those he worked with, and he was able to help the city accomplish many things that go well beyond the few projects I mentioned here. All while we were in transition, having served with three different administrators in the past year, as well as navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. Zach leaves us with some big shoes to fill, but we are grateful for our time working together here in Columbus, and we wish you well in your next adventure and know that you have a very successful future ahead of you. All the best and thank you, Zach.
Uh, also, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to report that on uh, September 2nd, the City of Columbus was notified that we have been awarded a Transportation Alternative Program, or TAP grant, to construct bicycle and pedestrian trails from the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Uh, the city was awarded up to $403,468 of federal funds to complete the project. This project is one of 28 projects that were approved for TAP funds during the 2020 through 2024 cycle. The project entails over 8,600 linear feet of trail by making connections between existing facilities to create an interconnected network allowing bicycles and pedestrians to safely reach points of interest throughout the city. The project will help implement the former Safe Routes to School plan by providing off-street trails that will provide a safe connection to the elementary school. The total cost for the project is estimated at $509,000 and is scheduled to begin in 2023 with design engineering and plan development likely starting in 2021. TAP projects are to be commenced within four years of the project award date. More details would be available at the, as the project progresses. This is an 80-20 grant that Planning Director Matthew Schreiber applied for in January of 2020, and the resolution 5-20 uh, was approved by the City Council this past March. Thanks to Matt, City staff, and Council for supporting this project that will enhance, enhance our quality of life, improve bike and pedestrian safety, and help to achieve part of the long-term vision for Columbus. Thanks, Matt. Good work. <clears throat> That's all I had. Unless there's anything else, so entertain a motion to adjourn. Adams moves to adjourn. Second. Five seconds. All right, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll be adjourned for a few minutes and return with the committee of the whole meeting. Thank you.
Yes, I can. Yeah, this is Bob, director of finance. Doing good. <laughs> okay, no worries. You bet. Good evening and welcome to the Columbus Common Council's Committee of the Whole meeting for Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. The time is now 6.59 p.m. We are in uh, Columbus City Hall Chambers. Um, this evening we have council here in City Hall Chambers and also one council member, Ian Gray, participating via Zoom, uh, as well as some city staff. Pat, would you please uh, take the roll call? Adams? Present. Oh, Gray? Present. McCabe? Here. Pfeifferone? Present. Reed? Here. Ryan? Here. Tome? Here. All present. Okay. This meeting has been noticed uh, with local state statutes and local ordinances. <clears throat> Number three, um, I know we were looking to maybe make some amendments to the agenda just to kind of make things easier for this evening. Um, Mayor Tom. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda and that we table item number 16 uh, for the evening and switch around the order of uh, item number 20 and 22. All the pipe roll. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Uh, with the stated amendments. Number four, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes. Number four, citizen comments. Did we have anybody signed up this evening? Um, Pat, on the sheet, did we have anybody signed up for citizen comment again? And then we didn't have anybody signed up for to participate via Zoom. Um, is there anybody present that would like to participate uh, in citizen comment this evening that didn't get a chance to sign up? All right, seeing none, we'll move on. Number five is uh, the department reports. Uh, this evening we have the department reports within our packet for um, the fire department report of, from August 2020, police Police report from August 2020, media coordinators report from August 2020, and then the treasurer's report from July 2020. Are there any questions or comments, concerns about the department reports? Seeing none, move on to number six, review and discuss the Eagle Scout project for Butterfly Trails Volunteer Park. Uh, <clears throat> do we have Eric Ratz with us this evening on Zoom. Everyone. Hi, Patrick. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yeah, it's Patrick Vanderson. Hi there. Um, I did I did relay to Eric uh, the item. Um, I I didn't confirm whether he'd be here tonight or not, but uh, that the crux of his question is um, clearance to uh, move forward with the Butterfly Trails Volunteer Park sign for his uh, Eagle Scout project. Jack, a little since Man. I've chatted yeah. Thanks, with Man. Eric via uh, email. Um, so when this whole process started last fall, um, it, my, my advice and my in communication with him is uh, the park signage in Kiwanis Park, which is basically right across the street from DVW's front door, 
uh, is one of the few, I should say, one of the park signs that we have in our parks. And, and it, uh, uh, aesthetically, I think it looks nice. And that was kind of the model I asked him to design uh, the park sign after. Of course, um, it took a while to actually come up with a park name when we went through the, the contest, which, you know, took some time. And I think it was sometime early April, right, that we had a park name. So at that point, uh, my advice was to basically take your design and then plop, plop the name right on the middle of the sign. And then you basically mm -hmm. have your sign and you can get ready to go. Um, most recently, he asked about what should it be made out of, what kind of materials. And there was some discussion back and forth between him and then I was really in the message to Zach Navin because Zach would have been in charge of kind of the maintenance of the sign once we accepted it. And Zach first wanted more of an aluminum because he was asking between aluminum and wood. Mm. Um, since then, I think it's been determined that wood is the most reasonable. Um, there might be a little bit more maintenance, but the cost is going to be lower uh, considering what the project is. Um, it, it just seems more reasonable to ask for a wooden sign there than it is in aluminum. So that's generally where we're at. So I, ha I haven't seen any final design from, from Eric, but generally, it's good if, and if you've driven past Kiwanis Park and you can picture it, um, that's what it's gonna look like. So um, that, that is, uh, I guess, what I know based on my communications with him. So any questions for me or for Patrick? Trina. Oh, uh, just a brief question. Would you be expecting a sketch before he starts creating the sign just to make sure it's what's expected? I have not asked for one, but that's certainly something council could request. And, and I don't <clears throat> know if Patrick has seen anything or not. I'm not, yeah, I know Eric has been, uh, I think, modeling his design with the likeness of the Kiwanis style. Um, and I, I know he's been talking to a Mason for the base, uh, but I haven't seen a sketch. Okay. I wonder if there's any issues with the longer name of the park <laughs> needing extra space. <laughs> Go ahead, Trina. Oh, uh, I mean, I don't feel like council itself necessarily has to see the sketch, but I would like someone to review it before he starts. Mm -hmm to create it just in case um, the placement is, the plan placement is a little odd. Um, for the name, I'm assuming he's gonna do two rows. Yeah, I would think it would say Butterfly Trails Volunteer Park instead of mm -hmm. one long. I mean, theoretically speaking, since it is a long name, you'd think that's how it would have to be placed on the sign. Okay. And I will be working with him to make sure when it goes up on site, at least that it's, in a location that makes sense, that doesn't block your vision as you're pulling out of the driveway or anything like that. So, in generally speaking, the way the site is, it's up, I mean, you kind of go up a little hill when you get there. So, I mean, it, there's only um, so many areas really where you can put it. And um, trying to explain it, it'd be the north, as you're dry, entering that driveway, it'd be the northeast kind of corner um, mm -hmm. where there's still a little bit of grass left between the grass and where they're plowing right now would be somewhere in there it would be my my thinking and it would be um, uh, perpendicular or uh, perpendicular to the road so you can see it both directions as you're driving um, so what's the direction on this are, are we going to have to move this forward to the next regular meeting or or what what direction do you need Mayor Tom. Um, my assumption is that he's probably looking for a nod uh, from us to say, go ahead and complete it, but without mm -hmm. seeing a picture or really having mm -hmm. anything tangible, what we're going to be doing is accepting a donation. Um, so I don't know if we can put this on the next regular agenda or not without having any review of that at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully if Matt can get some contact from, from Eric and maybe just get a mock-up or something to throw in here and a timeline of when it needs to be installed. It sounds like it's gonna be done this year yet. There's gonna be some other activity out at the park this fall yet too. So um, ultimately, I think that's what we're gonna to have to do is accept the donation. And we can do that probably before or after the install if we're satisfied with what, what the design is, I, I'm assuming. So mm -hmm. um, we'll just have to see how things play out between now and the next meeting if Matt can get us some information or make a recommendation. But I, I 
I don't know that we have enough to, to forward it to the next regular meeting, right. or if that really matters, the project can still move without the the acceptance of the donation. So. Okay. All yeah, right. I, I will follow up with him uh, and Patrick about the, the requesting a mock-up. I'm sure Patrick's took that note too. So. I do know he wants to move quickly because there's a timeline uh, window for which he has to complete the project in order to meet the. Um, Eagle Scout requirements. Okay. So, okay. As, right. as, as soon as I have a sketch or a mock up, I will share it via email with council, so they so they know just that might ease their fears and if yeah. you know to move this forward quicker potentially. So, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, number seven. Review and discuss Hayward Street change order number two. I see Jason approaching. We also have um, Joe here from Water and Light. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, just a quick summary. This is change order number two for Hibbert Street. If you recall, number one was just essentially based off of extending the timeline due to the late start. Number two is essentially surrounding some water main work uh, in the Maple Street, Hibbert Street intersection. Uh, when this project was designed, there was the intent to connect to the water main um, just outside of the intersection and continue down Hibber Street with the replacement. Uh, as we, as time became closer after the project was bid, there was some investigation on the site and there uh, was a lot of old main in that intersection that kind of crisscrossed a couple different locations. And uh, after talking with Water and Light and the contractor, uh, due to the installation of a deep sewer manhole, we felt like um, it would make sense to try and clean up some of this water main. Essentially what we did was we were able to abandon an old four inch that we weren't planning to abandon that runs east on Maple Street. Uh, so we ended up tying over some services to a ten, new 10 inch line or a newer 10 inch line. Uh, so we, we got some redundancy and we abandoned some small um, kind of parallel water main. Uh, we also tied in another valve uh, to that intersection, which also helps us control outages in the area. And so uh, if you look through the packet, there's quite a bit of information here. We issued what we call the work change directive ahead of the work, identifying time of material rates and had a sketch of what was anticipated, uh, along with an estimated hourly time between 15 and 20 hours. And then ultimately, um, there's a worksheet in the front uh, that shows what was actually uh, crude for time and effort associated with the job and that was um, That was the basis of the change order uh, So essentially there was some new 10 inch mains T's bends a valve put in there and some abandonment that occurred uh, All in told we're about eighteen thousand seven hundred four dollars as part of the change order It's all work that's been improved by water and light as far as uh, what was occur what occurred and uh, what the expenses were associated with it so uh, as of now, this change order does not modify uh, any of the timelines uh, due to that. That work was performed over a couple day period, so we didn't feel like a, an adjustment on time had to occur. And um, the total contract did increase then 18704, so we're looking kind of to ratify the work change directive and move that forward for approval at the council level per the contract requirements. Any questions for Joe or I? I didn't see none. It's unfortunate, but I think I think you warned us that there was maybe a chance of something like that in that specific area. Well, so. The good thing about the work that took place up at that intersection is that we never got an as-built plan from when the uh, some of that main was installed in the late 60s. Mm. So now we know exactly what's at that intersection, and uh, it, it just it's it's a real nice cleaned-up area. So, thanks, Joe. <clears throat> Mayor Tom. It's always good to get rid of four-inch water main, from my understanding yeah. as well. Um, we a couple of services too, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's my understanding then that this change order will actually be paid for on the water side. Is that correct? Through the utility? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, just a comment on that. 
there was one uh, area, there was, there was more pavement that was disturbed as part of the water main work, so there will be a slight increase in tonnage of asphalt and maybe some crushed egg base course, but we already have a contract unit price for that. So we'll be, we'll be saw cutting a, a slightly larger area, but I, you know, I think it's probably negligible dollars based on the current unit prices, but you know, there will be a slight increase, but again, it's new pavement, so I think there's a benefit to the city there. So. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for Jason or Joel? Okay. We can move on then to number eight, uh, review and discuss the Westside lift station generator addition. I believe, Jason, you're going to stay where you are for this one. Uh, yes. Uh, so just, again, to recall this project, um, this project was uh, part of the task order that was designed uh, previously by uh, Rupert Milkey. For a generator, if you recall, yeah, you have uh, numerous lift stations in the city, uh, some with and without generators. Um, there's been a trend towards redundancy and reliability and outages. Uh, obviously, um, lift stations need electricity to run, and if we're not pumping sewage, we all know where it goes. Uh, so we're constantly looking at ways to improve that. The DNR suggested we add some generators. We have a portable generator, but we can't run that to every station out there. So. This was an intent to add a generator to the west side lift station that serves all of the area north of Fuller, essentially west of Dick Street. And so that area kind of all drains into this location. We felt it was a key spot. We designed the generator building. And if you guys recall, there was a zoning issue for the building that we had to overcome here a couple meetings back. And that was approved by plan commission, ultimately you guys. And so we went out and we received bids uh, and I have it on my phone here. I apologize. Inadvertently, there was a summary, bid summary schedule that didn't get in the packet uh, that did outline the actual results of the bid. So there was five bidders, uh, Hogan Electric, Piper Power, Stob Construction, Forest Landscaping, and Symbiont. Uh, the bids all ranged from uh, the low, which is Hogan Electric, at $159,900, all the way up to about $222,000. And again, we'll get you a copy of this uh, more detailed breakdown. I will note that there was one mandatory alternate on this bid. And essentially what we had asked the bidders to do was to provide a secondary cost for a, a different manufacturer building type. So both buildings meet specifications. It's just a different manufacturer. So much like if you remember the screen project a while back, we bid two screens to see if we could get a better price on one. In this case, um, the 159900 does reflect uh, the cost uh, with the lower building alternative, uh, which saved the city about $12,000 uh, to bid out that alternative. So again, uh, the, the bid table will show that. I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew there was an alternate here and that it was just essentially an alternate for a manufacturer, uh, but for essentially the same product. Uh, the estimate for the project uh, we had at 160, so we came in very close. Um, we usually like to be kind of in the middle of the bid results, so this wasn't quite as good as we had hoped, but it still was in line with what we kind of anticipated the cost could come in as. So, as of now, we're going to go ahead and recommend um, recommend approval of this generator project, and hopefully, we can uh, get that constructed and some reliability and redundancy out on that lift station. So any questions about the bid? Not seeing any questions. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Perfect. Okay, number nine, uh, we've got review and discuss the RFP for the Christopher Columbus statue. Um, I think I'm going to uh, revert to Kyle, or sorry, I've got both your names written down here. Matt. So I prepared the memo So we had one submission uh, to the RFP that we issued uh, in late August mm -hmm. of this year. Um, it was from the Knights of Columbus, uh, as you see in the packet. J typically, with what we received, um, 
it was uh, the, the proposal was somewhat unresponsive to the RFP that we issued. So in review of the proposal, we had four options that four potential options that we laid out uh, to council. Um, that doesn't mean this is an exhaustive list of options. It could be a mix of this. Um, um, and just for purposes to, uh, for council to understand what was in the RFP, um, we put, I, I included the criteria for selection that we used uh, in the RFP that was approved by council. So you can see the, the five categories and what we were asking for. Mm -hmm. um, I guess with that, I'll open it up for any questions. And I believe uh, we have somebody from the Knights of Columbus. No, sorry. I that that was going to be else. my first question is to see, or well, is, is anybody well, here? Nice, but, okay. Um, but not prepared sorry. to. I wasn't part of the committee. Okay. Gotcha. So, so um, I guess, any questions? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, what did they submit? Did we get a copy? It, it, it just, should have been included in the packet, was it not? I don't have it. Uh-oh. I thought I... I probably screwed that up then. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, what? Sorry. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, what were the uh, what were the unresponsive parts of the? Well, generally, uh, it, it was a letter that was dated from before the RFP was issued. So everything that was submitted was they it was already the work had already been done. So, mm -hmm. um, it, not that that's a bad thing. It's just it is what it is. It was they already kind of had their proposal laid out, and uh, I apologize for the. Uh, uh, miscommunication on that. That's, uh, but uh, so that, that was really the big thing. I mean, I, I think, and it's my understanding that this was the proposal that um, they left uh, for the mayor that was never received, and I, I, I'm not really sure what happened with that mm -hmm. as well. But I mean, the proposal did come in on the uh, the, the fourth, which was the last day the RFP was open. So. Kyle, did you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, we did receive it on September 4th. Um, again, it was dated, I believe, July 16th. And, you know, I think what we were trying to do is establish whoever wanted it, what they were going to do with it, where they were going to propose using it. Um, you know, broadly, do they have a plan for what they're going to do? Do they have a budget for what they're going to do? You know, any kind of details like that. And, and so there just wasn't a lot there to really go on. And, mm -hmm. you know, my fear would be that we go down a path and then find out after the fact that, well, there's now, you can't even do what they want to do because there's zoning rules or setback rules or some other kind of uh, limitation on how they could use it. So I just want to make sure that, you know, as we choose a path that, you know, all the uh, unknowns are sort of taken care of. So that was, uh, that was sort of what led us to suggesting these four um, potential paths. Mm -hmm. uh, there are obviously many, many more you could uh, entertain, uh, but we're just really looking for a direction on what we'd like to, where we should head. Well, Pete. My, my thought is, you know, if they're the, they're the, I can talk. So they were the only ones that uh, expressed interest. So my thought would be to contact the Knights um, and basically say, hey, look, just let's go through the RFP again dot your I's, cross your T's, and let's see what we could do with that. And then if they, if and when they do that and they don't meet the criteria, then we reissue the RFP and see if we can attract somebody else. I would concur with that. I, I think, oh, go ahead, Trina. No, I, I'm also in agreement. I would like to contact the Knights of Columbus, uh, basically find out where they're planning to place it and if such placement would be allowable. Those are just my basic questions. And I don't know, I guess, if if they included anything about that. In, it didn't sound like they included anything in them and what they were what they sent to us, but... Um, I mean, I, I guess I don't feel like we have an overwhelming amount of options, um, so I'm, I'm okay with reaching out to the Knights of Columbus and kind of going over the RFP and asking for them to basically resubmit. Um, Mayor Tom. Uh, just to throw in my two cents here, I guess I think mm -hmm. there was a little confusion in the process. 
and the Knights were trying to contact me uh, at my home phone number and also my old address and we believe that the original resolution was dropped off at my old house that I haven't lived in so that kind of just threw a wrench in things so things got in here later but my understanding is that there's a resolution to approve uh, by the group to say that we're willing to accept it but there just wasn't any detail on where it was going to go um, I agree that we should probably try to communicate with them to find out what their plans are and I think the other um, Thing we probably want to consider that I heard Attorney Johnson mention through this process is that when it's handed over there's going to be a document that's going to have to be signed when it changes ownership I think that we can kind of cover <clears throat> some of these concerns with mm -hmm. that as well is that you know whatever they're planning to do with it needs to meet uh, local zoning ordinances etc language like that that can mm -hmm. kind of maybe help kind of expedite the process as well that they understand that there's an agreement between the city and them when they take it so but hopefully we'll we'll hear from a representative and we can kind of work on some of those details. Seeing a lot of nodding heads. Okay. You have the direction that you need, yeah, Matt. Okay. Great. Thank you, Matt. Ian. Yeah. So um, my only thing is I'd definitely follow up with the Knights of Columbus, but I do not see why there's any reason not to reissue the RFP at the same time. There's no reason not to put it back out there to anyone else while we're waiting on them. What's the council thing, Trina? Um, I suppose I would want to give the Knights of Columbus first dibs per se a chance to respond since they were the only ones that made the deadline even though they didn't um, have the form formation we were looking for. But that's just it, they didn't meet the deadline. No one did. So I, I, I don't see the reason not to put it back out to everyone while we get more information from them. I, I would agree with Alder, uh, Gray. Um, they did not properly meet the deadline. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay with it issue another RFP as well. Kyle? Um, I just want to point out that if we uh, recommend um, reissuing the RFP, that would occur in, uh, th I think, three weeks because we have an extended time period. So um, in that three weeks, that could be an opportunity to um, provide details prior to final approval of reissuing the RFP if the council was so interested. <clears throat> Peter. So if I'm understanding you correctly, so it's going to take three weeks to get the new RFP out. Mm -hmm. And within those three, and within that three weeks, we could have something more concrete from the Knights of Columbus. And yeah, and actually the approval from the council won't happen for three more weeks at the regular meeting. Oh, okay. Um, so it would be a starting point of you know, early October and then another extension of you know, how many days to be open and uh, receive that so I just thought it might be an opportunity that we could have it on the agenda if we don't get anywhere or don't get any more details then we're still primed to move forward with reissuing uh, but we could also consider at that time um, what additional information we have that makes most sense for sure then we can reissue it if we don't have it additional info from the Knights of Columbus or move forward with the Knights of Columbus okay I'm okay with that. Seeing a lot of nothing All right. The issue of the RFP, and one would get tabled depending on what we have. Am I hearing that? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Kyle and Matt. Um, number ten is Sorry, review. Before we move on, are, are oh, those go ahead. Coming to Sorry. the next committee of the whole meeting for a review or to the regular meeting, just to clarify. It, if the RFP needs to be issued, it would have to go to the regular meeting. But mm -hmm. um, if the Knights bring back some information, I mean, the RFP information that we're looking for, does that need to be reviewed at the Committee of the Whole? I just want to be clear on that mm -hmm. before we move over it. Yeah, I would anticipate, yeah. Uh, I got my order kind of backwards there. Yeah. Um, if we wanted to do that method, we would have to do one of those kind of strange, call the regular meeting mm -hmm. to order, then adjourn it, conduct the committee as a whole and then okay uh, but it, it's an option so okay thanks okay 
Okay. Um, we have number 10 up next, uh, which is review and discuss Fireman's Park rental. Um, we do have Amy Jo here from the Recreation Department. Amy, did you want to come up and say a few words here? Hello. Hello. So um, basically what we have in front of you is our intent to create a separate rental agreement for anybody who rents Fireman's Park. Um, I do have two groups that rent it. We have the 4th of July committee and the Catholic campers that come and rent it for a week. Um, the Catholic campers do not use any of the open shelters. They use the green space, which comes with a pavilion. So they basically just rent the pavilion, but they're using the entire green space. Whereas the 4th of July rents the concession stand, the open shelters, the green space, and the pavilion. So the Recreation Committee, we're trying to come up with a way to have a separate rental agreement, separate from the pavilion contract. I did create a draft that I'd like Attorney Johnson to look at, that's in your packet, um, that kind of lays everything out. Um, and we're asking also to increase the rate of which they pay. They currently pay $500 for the entire week to rent the entire park with a $1,000 deposit. Um, and this was a price that was just provided, I think about six or seven years ago. We brought this to council and council came up with $500. Um, but since then we've added a couple of meters in the park and the city is now being charged for water and utility. So just trying to find a way to balance, not really to um, just you know balance out our cost on the city, city portion of it. And didn't the we best just- Best way to get there, I'm not sure. <laughs> the pavilion rental itself for you know wedding venues and such also went up last year, correct? So it did. It, this correct. is currently to rent the entire park is a lot less than to just rent the pavilion right now, is that right? Mm -hmm. So just as for perspective, yeah. So I'm sure there's questions, so we can work this out together. Sure. I do have a, also a breakdown of the rest haven and the open shelter rates, the concession stand, and then of course the pavilion rates in there as well. Mm -hmm. Questions initially from council? I just my question would be if you're renting the pavilion for a wedding you said it, it automatically comes with a green space what happened if you don't have a use for the green space and somebody else wants to rent the green space i mean is there a way of breaking that separating those two or i haven't really had anybody rent it we i did have somebody who opened rented it for um a car show they had 10 cars there we just came up with a hundred dollars i mean there really isn't anything set and i'd like to have some consistency and that's why we're here. Do we break it out for resident, non-resident rate for a green space cost? Um, just trying to have a conversation so that it can be consistent moving forward. I just don't feel like I'm there right now and it, I just want to be. Thank that's you. That's a good question. Thank you. Mayor Tone. Um, I remember having this discussion when I was on the rec committee about probably five or six years ago, if not mm -hmm. longer. And it uh, it gets pretty confusing pretty quick, and I I, um, I I think that I'd like to see things broken out individually, and then just say here it, because I I think we're assuming that there's only going to be a certain class of renter that's going to take the entire park, like the the people that we know that have rented it, mm -hmm. um, and each one of those is going to be different. What I am concerned about though is that if we go through this whole process and say here's what the whole park is. And we're kind of gearing that towards local nonprofit organizations. If someone from Madison wants to have a music festival for three days here and they look at our prices and go, well, I'm going to Columbus and they rent out the entire park for dirt cheap and it's a private ticketed event, we don't have a park that we can use, I guess. So mm -hmm. I just think there's other possibilities here as I know the pavilion's been attracting a lot of attention the last couple of years because our prices are very reasonable. We try to keep them low for residents and kind of you know elevate the price for non-residents. Non yeah. So those are kind of the concerns. And I think if there's a potential for additional revenue out of that, if someone wants just the pavilion in the green area and someone else wanted to do something in a different part of the park, um, or if they wanted the entire park and not the pavilion, you could still get revenue off of a private rental at the pavilion while there's a public thing happening in the park. 
right. so i don't know the easiest way to accomplish that but i feel like just having one big chart with each property and each classification of renter kind of shows here's what it would cost to rent the entire park a la carte i guess and then maybe agree on a, a price for the the local nonprofits and mm -hmm. the local residents um and maybe elevate that price for for profit out of town type of in, you know entities that may want to come forward and, and start utilizing that that's just my two cents anyway uh, the utility part of it too i'll mention i i don't want to make it any harder than it has to be but my concern is that if if we have to wait for the cycle of the utility bill to come through and hold on to mm -hmm. deposits that you may be creating a whole lot of work for yourself of having to kind of keep track of all that and hold deposits until the utility bills are paid rather right. than just kind of putting a nominal utility charge on each Flat rental feet. where there's utilities involved um, to help kind of make up the cost of those additional utilities. I just think it would be easier that way, but I would defer to Attorney Johnson on any you know, okay. recommendation he's got on how we would do that best. Mm -hmm. Ian. And I agree with uh, Andrew on what he's saying, and I don't, I think we should just ensure that any utilities possibly that they would possibly use would be covered by the amount of rent that um, they're paying. I don't think we should factor it in on any sort of individual basis. It, it, we should just ensure that potential utilities would be more so than more than covered by the rental. And we should definitely have different classes. You know, like whether it's for an individual for a wedding or whatever they're doing, or a nonprofit. Whether that individual and or nonprofit is local, and whether it's for profit, if it's for profit, it should be a completely scale of rental. Mm -hmm. The pavilion <clears throat> and the open shelters are set up that way. It just we don't have a specific park rental where it's closed down to everybody. Mm -hmm. Trina, right? I, I think that. Okay. The pavilion things for the for profit category should increase. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then I just was wondering even further if there was going to be separate uh, weekday and weekend cost, would it make any difference? It could. It could. We do have separate prices for weekday and weekend on the open shelter, well, the pavilion only pavilion. and the rest haven. Um, open shelters are $50 throughout the day, mm -hmm. the week. Good point. Uh, just piggybacking off of the uh, utilities. Turn your mic on, please. Oh, mic. Hey. Let me turn my there mic on. <laughs> uh, so just piggybacking off of the utilities and the flat fees, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's a way, uh, so say you have like 100 people, that equals that amount of a flat fee. You have 50 people, that equals that amount of a flat fee for utilities. Ballparking it and just making it, that way you have like something stable and then you can have some people check it out and see what that is. I think it's difficult when you have events like the 4th of July when you can't really anticipate and maybe oh. weather will impact and, and oh, okay. obviously those, those, um, um, those vendors use a lot of electricity. Um, I think but, I was thinking more of like weddings and stuff. So that's right, my, right. No. Yep. Mm -hmm. I and the draw. weddings, for the most part, would be the, the green space. I mean, they play bags and ladder golf, and they disc golf, you know, with the pavilion. Mm -hmm. So. Well, Amy Jo, I want to just I, I want to just thank you for bringing this to us. I think it's going to be more of a discussion kind of. Oh, uh, I, I thought that it would, and I'm glad mm -hmm. that we're that we're here. But just at least to find to have a, a set plan, be consistent with every type of rental, whether it's resident, non-resident. Profit, nonprofit, weekend, weekday. <laughs> so, but as far as breaking it out, do you have a suggestion on how we start putting a plan together? A like green space would be one area. Mm -hmm. Yay. <laughs> um, I don't know how to yeah, do I, it in thirds. Green space, pavilion, then entire park or? Would that be closed to the rest of the residents of the park then? I mean, have we ever had any event like that? Obviously, we have the 4th of July, but that's obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you're not paying to get and in. And the or... Catholic campers do rent it, but they the park is actually open to anybody who wants to go 
to the shelters. I, I have rented open shelters in Rest Haven mm -hmm. while they've been there in the green space, and they're fine with that. Okay. So. Is there any other, I guess, I, I mean, we could reach out to other municipalities and kind of see what they do just to, for I ideas if other municipalities have parks that are able to be rented out as a whole? Um, that I don't know, but I can yeah. find out. Maybe I think just to gather some more ideas and how. Um, sure. I like the notion of um, sort of a la carte. However, then with that said, like the insurance companies do, if you you know you did one, two, or three items, then maybe there's a discount on you know, so you're not paying full price for all three, and you know you want one and this one here, and mm. maybe um, I don't know how exactly it works, but um, maybe there'd be like a, a fifty percent fifty percent off on the, on the smaller of the two, you know, included with the first one. Just a suggestion. Any other direction you think for Amy Jo? Well, I, I don't know. I might be missing it, but I don't really see a for profit category. Resident or non resident is essentially yeah, the categories now. That covers more of you know any type of venue, like if they're having a wedding or anything there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not really a for-profit venue. Like the, that's not in like what if there is a concert that's for-profit and they're charging twenty-five dollars a head. Mm -hmm. That should be a different category. I think most agree here, Mayor Tom. I like that suggestion because I think we've been dealing with some wrestling with some issues in the past. And that's not a classification that we really have. And there could be different requirements for that as well, uh, for liability, et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. licensing for picnic license, et cetera. But I think maybe creating that extra for-profit class would kind of help cover us there. Mm -hmm. That's a good suggestion. Yep. Breaks it out even further. Okay. So, so far, I guess we have for-profit versus non-for-profit or non-for-profit. Um, obviously, I think we're all That's in favor of sticking with uh, the resident, non-resident, different rates. But mm -hmm. how does that work when it's profit, non-profit? Is that profit, if it's for profit, you just pay that for profit, regardless of whether you're a resident or not? Yeah, I don't think, personally, I don't think there's a reason for a for profit venue to be resident or not resident. Sure. Yeah, the only thing I could think of would be, like you said, Mayor, about a concert. They're charging admission to mm -hmm. get into the concession stand. Although, I'm, if it's a local this, high school band or a mm -hmm. local, um, you know, so. Yeah. Okay, I'll um, brainstorm and put some things together. I appreciate the ideas. Mayor, did you want to speak? Yeah, no? my other suggestion, I think, is just in if we can kind of get all this stuff into like one spreadsheet, like all these different things, like sure. if you were going to rent the entire park and then break out each one, like Trina said, you know, there's a different rate for a weekday versus a weekend. We're just assuming because of the client that we've had in the past is that they, they rent it for a week. What if someone wants to rent it for three days? What if those three days are Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, or what if they're Monday, Tuesday, and have, Wednesday? Do you not have this um, in your contract, in your packet? I have this. This one here, yeah, that, with the highlight. That does break it down rates. what the prices are mm -hmm. for weekday and weekend. It it does, but it's just hard for me to put it all I, in one spreadsheet. Well, if, gotcha. so, if someone wants to see, hey, I'm thinking about renting out the park, that it's very easy that they go look. Okay, I'm I'm a non-resident, or I'm for profit, and you go all the okay. way down the thing, and here's how much it's going to cost me to do it for one day. Here's how much it is for a week. Got it. It's just easier to read. That's just my suggestion, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not a do. spreadsheet guy, so. Um, Mike McCabe. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, I know Beaver Dam has Swan City Park, and they have several different uh, things going on there, and they have a band um, pavilion thing, so I don't know how they rent theirs out, but it might be uh, something to look into, ask Beaver Dam how they uh, monetize that Swan City Park. Good suggestion. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank Just you. My last thought is yeah. we have to consider how many improvements we've been making there, like how much the CHLPC has been doing and how much better of a of the facilities we have 
and start reflecting that in the rental prices. They're all really low. Okay, thank you guys. All right, thank you. Moving on to number 11, we have review and discuss Fireman's Park ball field use with the Columbus School District. Um, Kyle's gonna lead this off for us tonight. I spy Annette Downman in the back, I believe, um, if we have further questions. Uh, yeah, so Zach and myself did have a meeting uh, with the school district and uh, you know, kind of talked about a couple of the issues we talked about at our last meeting and sort of the desire to do a lease versus uh, complete transfer or change of ownership. Um, I haven't heard in the meantime that there's been any claims to the parcels or any concerns about transferring. So that, um, that hasn't, uh, I guess, come to bear, which is a good thing uh, mm -hmm. that no one came out of the woodwork with some kind of document that we didn't know existed. Um, uh, the school, and, and I, I think they may want to speak to this themselves, but I think their concern uh, primarily was right now uh, we have the shared facility use agreement, and if they put in you know new lights, new turf, and then suddenly the city gets it back, they've put in all those improvements, and now they can't even use them potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and you know I don't think that our intent is to you know try to yank the parcel back, and I don't think that's um, uh, their ID, idea either is to suddenly take ownership and then remove it from the public use. Um, but when they do put in these improvements like the, uh, the, the turf, uh, there are certain things you can and can't do on it and uh, damage can happen. So um, that was some of their concerns. One thing that we talked about during our discussion was if we're viewing this in a shared use facility uh, kind of lens, there could be items built into the, the transfer that if we stopped having a cooperative agreement and we're no longer sharing facilities, that that could be a trigger event to give the city the opportunity to reclaim ownership um, so that we would be able to have a baseball field and football field for the public again. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of these things are really uh, up in the air yet, uh, but uh, potentially the school may want to speak to that, but uh, lease was not an option that they were very comfortable with. Trina. Oh, I'm trying to recollect. Was there language if we were to uh, sell the area for $1 that the city would have right of first refusal? I think we had talked about that and not only being right of first refusal um, because if, if they say, yeah, someone's going to pay us $5 million and the city can certainly pay us $5 million first, but that there'd be some recognition of transferring it for a dollar, getting it back at a dollar um, if they no longer needed it for school purposes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anybody else have questions or concerns immediately? Yeah. So oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so pretty much they, they don't want the lease. They just want to outright own it and then they can have put the improvements in there. And that's, I mean, I don't see a problem yeah. really with it. Thank you for bringing up that the fact that they may be putting in turf or something that could be damaged by the public if you, um, so I think one of the main concerns last time was that people are used to using this field and used to having it be open to the public. So it may just take some, you know, community education if they're investing in the field and, um, you know, that it, it shouldn't be, um, I guess, damaged. Yeah, and, and that was a concern that uh, Zach Naven had brought forward as, yeah. you know, if, if suddenly this becomes completely off limits at all times, that could be a, a something that the community uh, views in a, a negative light. But I certainly understand the other aspect of, if you do make an improvement that can't be treated, um, mm -hmm. you know, just in any certain way, um, that becomes problematic. Sure. Uh, the other concern, but I, I haven't heard back if it's been solved or not yet, but uh, if they were to lease the property, we were a little uncertain as to how some of the statutes that talk about things you can and can't do on school property, 
uh, if the school doesn't own it, we weren't exactly certain that, um, a few weeks ago whether or not the laws transferred if they didn't own it. So we have Annette Duman, Duman here. Um, she's the Columbus uh, super, uh, School Superintendent. So she's here to speak on the school thing. Yeah, Thanks. hi everybody. And hi. thank you for engaging in the discussion with us. Um, uh, it's it, It's been a great discussion and I can't uh, thank Kyle and Zach enough. And um, I just wanna um, just uh, thank Zach. I know he's not here and I was hoping he'd be on the call but I know he's not here. Um, Thank him uh, particularly for um, everything he has done, um, and I know that he's going to um, be um, exiting from the city um, very very soon. But um, Troy and I, in particular, want to just thank him for everything he has done and um, working in collaboratively with our shared use facilities agreement. We have really enjoyed working with him and um, it, the partnership that we have had. It's it's been really wonderful working with him. So um, as we've been going in this discussion, um, in particular with the um, lease, I did contact um, our council, and if there were to be a lease, so if we were to engage like in a 99 year lease situation, um, so if the district were to lease the property from the city, um, any participants that we had then, because they would be basically, we're the tenants, anyone, any participants that we had and any activities that we had on it would be under our policies basically for events that we had on our property. The only issue or on your property that we had, but, but the only issue would be making sure that people understood it's a school event and then because of all those um, concerns, but it, because we kind of do have those issues now with people understanding with at the football field, it's a city-owned property, but it's a school event, and we do continue to have issues with people understanding that you have to follow school rules, even though it's city property, that type of thing. Okay. So we would just have to continue to do, like you had said, um, really do a lot of educating with people understanding that, yes, we do lease the property, but you have to follow school rules, school policies, um, state, basically, rules in regards to the school. That type of thing. Thank you, Annette. You're welcome. Any other questions? And any questions? Hmm? And just to clarify, like a turf idea would mm -hmm. be something that's very far down the road, but um, <laughs> we um, would look to really upgrade um, the, like a, I should say a synthetic turf would be very far down the road, but mm -hmm. an upgrade in the turf field um, and any of the existing grounds is something that we would look to do uh, in short order, really to upgrade what the, the playing field that the students would be playing on. And we do really consider it right now an educational facility because our kids do, even during the day for phi ed courses, et cetera, go mm -hmm. on those fields. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What is, I guess, thoughts from the council as far as Mayor, Mayor Tom? I, I guess I don't really have uh, any large concerns about, um, you know, transferring it. I, I just thought when the city attorney had mentioned the 99-year lease, I felt like we could really kind of capture all the concerns in a lease agreement, but perhaps that's not the, the right way to do it. So I think that if we are going to go down this path, we'd have to have Paul Johnson start constructing some language that kind of catches everything on the city side, uh, you know, that we can kind of send over to the school to say, does this satisfy concerns, et cetera. Um, and that may take a little bit of time. So I think what we need to do is figure out tonight if we have consensus to kind of take that that road of the transfer or not. Mm -hmm. And I, I have no problem with starting that personally. So. I don't have any particular issue with that either as far as the transfer for $1. Um, that seems okay to me. Trina. Oh, uh, as long as there is language about uh, reselling not be not being allowed and it being transferred back for a dollar if the district no longer needs it, I would be very comfortable for the one dollar sale. A lot of heads nodding. Okay. Um, looks like we have consensus, I guess, and just to get the ball rolling and um, and get the agreement started. So. Uh, just a quick thing, and 
and it's a link for person to this and I suppose is has anyone but the school used this? If we transfer to the school, are our citizens losing anything? I think it's included uh, in the packet that there's a um, 14 and under football league that is run by the recreation department. It's my understanding. It says in there, I think it says it brings in brings in less than a thousand dollars in revenue, um, and or the Columbus Fourth of July committee uses it to light off fireworks. Um, but I think that's all that's really known. Do you have further concerns or? Ian, did you have any further concerns on that? I don't know. There's really not any information in my bag. I'm not sure that we understood that. <laughs> Could you repeat that, please? There's not really any information in my packet about how it's used for anything other than school events. So maybe I'm missing something. Okay, I just um, in the in the memo, it was in the background uh, under the section background, um, and it was the second paragraph down that kind of just talked about um, and the city related use on this field is uh, for U14 baseball, sorry, and crawdads, which is overseen by the city of Columbus Recreation Department and brings in less than a thousand dollars in revenue or the 4th of Col uh, the Columbus 4th of July committee to light off fireworks. If this sale took place, it would also mean reduced annual maintenance efforts as well as long term facilities maintenance by the city of Columbus. Right in the memo on the agenda item. Right. Yeah, but that's the only known activities that are city activities that are taking place there yeah. in an organized okay. fashion. Yeah, not a ton of info, but fine. It, it just seems odd to do things in this way. I mean, it's a city resource that we're giving away, but that's fine. I'm okay with the... Oh, Kyle, go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to add that I believe yeah. this would remain under our shared... Uh, facility use agreement so uh, the rec program would still have access to it and it would be treated you know in, in the way that we share other facilities and if there's that trigger that if we end up you know coming to a point where we no longer share facilities at all uh, if that's built into the uh, the transfer then we're a little bit protected to say that you know e even in the event everything falls apart we can always still have that facility for the public to use in the event that we no longer share Okay. All right. Sounds like you have the direction that you need to get things going and get Paul Johnson to work up some paperwork. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Um, let's see here. We can move on then to number 12, which is review and discuss the crop lease agreement renewal with Hine Farms. <clears throat> So this came back from the last meeting. Uh, we had City Attorney Johnson update the new lease um, with under Section uh, 2 when it talks about the term auto renewing in May of each year. Um, if there's no notice, um, if there is notice, it would go through the end of the growing season of that year or the current current crop years is, is the correct term. Um, I have shared this with uh, our current uh, renter, uh, Hind Farms. I have not received any comments to date. I've, I've sent an email and a voice message, and I have not heard anything one way or the other. Um, he did indicate originally that um, he was concerned over some of the investment he makes up front with the fertilizer, and he talked about maybe having some sort of language in there that would credit him part of his rent or some sort of way to work out so he's not out anything if we decide the flexibility or that we are not renewing. So um, I, I think the draft is uh, reflects what was discussed at the last meeting, and I think it's ready to go forward to the next meeting. 
Council. Sorry, Kyle. Kyle. Uh, yeah, uh, just to, to add on to what Matt said, I think uh, the, the farmer did have have a reasonable observation that uh, I think it's lime. It might have been that they put down, and it mm -hmm. has a multi-year effect, and it could cost mm -hmm. as much as fifty dollars an acre. Uh, so, you know, if we have some reason to terminate, we have a project that we're waiting on. It seemed reasonable to say if it cost you fifty dollars an acre to put that on in the past year, or you know, even eighteen months, something like that that uh, we just credit back the $50 an acre that it cost them and call it a wash because we're not talking about a lot of acreage and $50 an acre to hold up a project, it's gonna be a very small cost for us and might alleviate the farmer's concern that we're just trying to you know, get some benefit and then pull the rug out from under him. Mm -hmm. Any input or questions? Seems to be making sense. I don't have any specific concerns about this, um, so I'm okay with moving that forward. Um, then Mayor Tomes got his light on here. Is that language reflective in this draft right now as far as what, is what you're talking about, Kyle? Um, it is not at this point, but uh, that's a new term. Uh, since we had the last meeting and this draft was presented, uh, that concern came up in discussion, and uh, we haven't heard back from you know, kind of farmer on what his position is, but I, I think uh, if the council was comfortable with that, we could offer that as uh, taking that argument off the table. Then I, I don't have any problem with adding that that language. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it will become an issue. But literally, over a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, if if we need to determine the police, we we would want to do what's right anyway. So, mm -hmm. Trina. Oh. Uh, I would also be comfortable having some sort of language on refunding possible investments. Um, I would just like to have a like not to exceed number. I don't think he'll be putting in a huge amount, but just so he's aware. Mm. What number would you start at? <laughs> I don't know much about farming, but when you say the $50 an acre. Um, you know, potentially we could just say uh, not to exceed the you know, annual cost of the lease. And so you're that really capped at $100. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I think we're okay to move that forward then. All right. Um, Number 13 is review and discuss the CDBG close timeline. We've got Matt standing up there. Matt, you're a busy guy tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's been a busy couple weeks. Um, so um, y you can see uh, we've talked over the last uh, oh, two years off and on with the council about the CDBG close and, their, and the process. Uh, most recently, uh, council approved the uh, stormwater projects that we presented. So now is the fun part of getting through the grant application process. Um, and based on discussions that I had with City Administrator Ellison, we decided to lay out at least a, a, a draft timeline of how things are gonna work. Um, and it, it, trying to get through to the finish line here for, uh, for the grant applications. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I'm going to say is when you look at the, the timeline, I'm still in the process of determining project eligibility. So what that means is um, the DOA gives you a preliminary review where you show this is the area of benefit, this is what we're proposing to do, and they give you an initial yes or no before you go through the work of actually completing the entire application and submitting it. So I, I still I wanted to have that before tonight, and I, I don't have that. Um, but I'll be working to have that uh, soon. Um, and the other thing to note is the LMI survey, I need to uh, rethink that number because I, I was a little um, probably ambitious trying to get that done in the next two weeks. Um, but once we have the project eligibility, which based off of what the application says and the area of benefit that we've identified, we think the project will meet the LMI, or will meet the, uh, CDBG national objectives. Um, so then really the big thing we need to do f 
for this application is to go through the citizen participation plan. So um, in the packet, and this one I actually remember to do it, is the uh, sample uh, citizen participation plan from CDBG. Um, so council will need to go and uh, pass a resolution to support the participation plan. We'll have to designate a citizen participation committee. One thing I'm, I'm uh, I, I still need to verify with the OA is if can we use an existing committee or do we actually have to create a right. new one? Uh, it's my understanding we can use an existing committee. So if we want to use CDA or Planning Commission or one of these other commissions that I staff, I think it would be um, it would make sense to use the existing framework, especially considering right now how hard it is to get people to uh, sign up for uh, volunteer for committees and commissions. Um, the, it, the other thing to note is we do have to have one initial public hearing to talk about uh, the CDBG um, objectives and community development goals, um, a lot, basically aligned with the CDBG program. Um, so that's a more general public hearing, and that's before we have our, pro our grants or projects approved. And then at a later date, we'll have to have a second public hearing um, regarding the projects. Um, but that would, that would come after we submit our grant application. Um, so basically, as we work through the Citizen Participation Commission or commi the committee and, and have that initial public hearing, then uh, there will be a sample resolution that I have that will obviously tailor to the City of Columbus. And I would anticipate uh, that accompanying a, a grant application that would come to council in December. Um, so that's... That's the timeline as I have it laid out right now, hopefully to get through that and give us a little bit of wiggle room if we need to um, to, to maybe move a project or, or to um, have some, just have a little bit of flexibility because I know the next couple months are gonna be busy for me, but I, I think this is something we can achieve and get a project um, approved through this program. Any questions about the timeline? <clears throat> I think the timeline looks okay. I think you. And this yeah. is something that you're going to see on agendas and agendas basically for the rest of the year. So, mm -hmm. um, I would I would guess between now and the end of the year, there's always going to be something related to CDBG close on the agenda. Um, Do you need direction on I guess as far as. Um, Obviously, you said you can use an existing commission or committee. You said, or you need to clarify that yet. Um, I, I I need to clarify that, and okay. I w that would be on a memo on the the cow on the six. Okay. Um, and at that point, I would be asking, and I'll probably be. I know we have an extra week between the next um, meeting, so I'll probably may, I might just d directly call Michael and get his input on what he thinks would be best, and put it in the staff report on the sixth for the council to consider. Okay, Mayor Tom, um, is this a timeline that you've kind of set up? Is is this going to turn into a pumpkin if we don't have all the steps done by the end of the year, or is this just your own timeline? Um, this was the timeline that I set up to try to get this uh, through and approved. Okay. Um, but does it need to be approved by the end of the year? It needs to be approved by January 31st, okay. 2021. Yeah. 2021. Uh, okay. And I, I have not received uh, any final verdict, but I've heard rumors that they might extend the deadline even a little bit more due to COVID, but that mm -hmm. has not been determined. So I, I'm trying to, I'm, the reason why I shot for the end of the year is I, I do want to build in a little wiggle room right um I, I wish i had more but it you know it is what it is at this point so okay thanks matt okay thank you let's see any questions so we can move on to <clears throat> where are we number 14 review and discuss the conditional use permit for taco bell and Matt's still standing there. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So uh, on Tuesday or Tuesday, Thursday evening, uh, we had a plan commission and plan commission met. They held the public hearing and held a, I guess, a fairly lengthy review of the proposal that we have um, from the applicant to construct a Taco Bell at 109 Dick Street, which is currently the Badger Car Wash. Um, 
currently uh, the applicant has uh, the property under contract and uh, really they, they need the conditional use permit for the drive-through um, facility on a, a, a for a fast food restaurant so um, with that they've submitted the application we held the uh, we um, uh, published the notice in the Columbus Journal um, and uh, went through that process uh, on Thursday. Uh, working through this process, this has been reviewed at the staff level a few times. Um, Jason Letha pr provided some comments on September, on September 1st. Uh, the applicant has worked to revise their plans and the plans that are in your packet are actually the revised plans from uh, 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 from uh, Jeff Ferrari. Um, the one thing to note is in your packet, I didn't put the full set of plans because the full set of plans is like 50 pages. Mm -hmm. I just uh, included the set of plans that are applicable to a conditional use permit. So you're talking site plan, landscaping plan, lighting plan, uh, uh, stormwater, uh, and uh, grading plans. So, th so those are kind of the basic plans that, are, that we require for a conditional use permit. Mm -hmm. um, you can see in the staff report and you can also see can see on the conditional use permit which we're going to record at the county mm -hmm. once the sale is complete um, the 11 conditions we're requiring um, by uh, uh, the applicant uh, to uh, basically open his restaurant as proposed um, the one thing that came out of plan commission uh, they, they wanted to see an enhanced landscaping plan from what you see in your packet. Uh, there's there's no trees planted or there's no plantings along the southern border, and the thought was we uh, the plan commission requested to see uh, four to five shade trees along that southern border to basically um, to, to provide some shade to the parking lot parking area and provide kind of a natural buffer between the Culvers and the Taco Bell. Um, uh, if I chime in i also yep. remember hearing something uh being on plan commission about the lighting plan in a oh yeah, yeah. that amendment. was the, the other was to um and that's something that uh i should say jason letha is also still i don't think he has the um he hasn't issued his final letter regarding their comments but uh they the request was to make sure the lighting plan is more adequate where the road meets the um, right away or the, the, the property line so essentially um, as as pedestrians are walking down the sidewalk there's better lighting at the inter the driveway so because um, there's this public dri or public sidewalk that crosses correct, that driveway correct. so that was um, the, the other uh, one of the other items that I that uh, working through this that uh, council needs to approve is under 86 191 d2 um, the council it has the authority to grant exceptions to driveway widths for um, a commercial driveway. One of the uh, issues from the beginning that staff worked with uh, the applicant on uh, was we wanted one driveway on on the dicks, mainly due to to limit the access points uh, for safety reasons. So they the applicant was willing to uh, have one driveway onto Dick Street. Um, what they proposed though was 36 feet wide at the property line and by code you can only have 32 feet. So we thought uh, staff is recommending that um, granting the exception and it, it, when you look under eight, uh, 86 191 D2 it says council may um, grant the exception uh, for cases for safety to enhance safety or access. I, I can't remember exactly what it said. Um, but I do know it, it, if it was related to safety, uh, council is well within their rights to grant an exception. So, um, I, and obviously I, I, I put that in the recommendations for the um, conditional use permit. Um, the, uh, I guess with that, is there any any questions? I'm sure sure there are a few that I could walk through for this project, but. I those, just, those were the main main points coming out of Planning Commission. So, thank you, Matt. I just wanted to mention the lighting thing and um, just how it kind of ties into if we are granting potentially granting them an exception 
to our own uh, rule of 32 foot wide mm -hmm. driveway, um, yeah, we would want that sidewalk to be lit because I think that the reason why we have a 32 foot wide standard is to, you know, limit, uh, you know, or enhance pedestrian safety in general. So um, if hopefully that lighting plan can be amended so that uh, pedestrians can be well seen in that wider entry point entry exit in this case it, and I should also note I guess now that uh, if there are any questions I do have the project manager from uh, River Valley Architects has joined tonight Bryant uh, Christensen is on is on zoom so if you have any questions that might be more uh, directed towards uh, the project manager you can um, uh, we do have somebody to speak on behalf of the applicant so any other questions mayor Tom I don't have a question, but I uh, wanted to thank Matt and staff for mm -hmm. working with the developer. I know there's been mm -hmm. rumors for the last couple of years about a Taco Bell, and I think when they open this, they may have to have one-way traffic for the first week because I think it's going to be pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Columbus has wanted a Taco Bell for a while, so this is, is good news, uh, and to see some, some new development out in that area is, is great. So thanks for all your work on this. Any other concerns or questions or statements? The, the one thing that I guess is the most critical is under item five uh, is when we approve this, uh, well, assuming council approves this on the, the six, I shouldn't get ahead of myself, um, the plans that are dated that are accepted, um, that is what the expectation is that will be built. So. That, that's the one thing it, it's blank in the in the conditional use permit that's going to be recorded I just want council to be aware of I mean there's still a little bit of tweaking mm -hmm. um, we had some discussion at the plan Commission level if you look at our code we defined what a major change is versus a minor change um, it, nothing will I, uh, to my knowledge uh, uh, nothing will exceed what a minor change is so there's going to be some some tweaks um, but for the most part uh, um, we'll have a full set of plans and that will the the plans will go out You know with the packets for your review. So if you have any questions, you, you'll be able to see it before the meeting on the sex so Because um, because that's really I mean that's really what the expectation is under five This is what the site's gonna look like so Okay Thank you, Matt Thank you. Okay We'll move on to number 15, update on Butterfly Trails, Volunteer Park. We have Matt Schreiber. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. Well, I can, I can kick this off. I, I did write the memo for, for this. Um, I, so I received uh, a motion from, uh, from the uh, Odd Fellows from mm -hmm. one of their recent meetings along with some updated information. And uh, with that, um, we, we realized this needed to come back to council for some review and discussion to understand uh, what, what is going on uh, with the site. So um, some of the issues that I laid out in the memo, and I, I guess I didn't really get into uh, great lengths, was you know, site layout. You know, right now, what was conceptually approved generally was a one-acre butterfly garden somewhere in the middle of it. Um, we've said that we want to do trails along the waterway at some point in the future, but we've never really de uh, determined when. And we've always said that we want a 50 foot wide buffer strip along the river to basically follow best practices through DNR um, to reduce phosphate runoffs into the Crawfish River. So th that's generally what was approved before. Um, and it, there, there were certain things that were, seemed to be changing, and we wanted to make sure Council was aware of what was going on. But you know, we still think that this is going to be a good project for our community. It's just making sure there's communication between uh, staff, odd fellows, and council. So um, really what we're trying to do, um, or at least start the discussion tonight, is um, the timing. You know, how do we prioritize the projects? When do we want to consider um, actually having the trails? Uh, and then developing some sort of budget. And then... Um, the odd fellows have graciously uh, committed to helping fundraise once we kind of have all these bigger picture picture items identified. Um, and I know um, 
The mayor's met more recently with members of the Odd Fellows, and I know Patrick's here tonight. Um, and I, I guess at this point, I'll kick it over to I think Michael to start, and then Patrick can interject. So sure, thanks, Matt. I think he kind of uh, hit the basic premise there. I, I've been down to the site the last couple of weeks several times to meet with met with Patrick uh, last last week uh, and uh, Winfield McDonald and. As you see in the um, packet, I, I believe the Odd Fellows kind of had an update uh, as a group to kind of go over this, and I think there's a lot of ideas out there right now about um, what uh, what different people would like to see at the site. But since we've only really approved an MOU, which contains the butterfly garden and the the uh, the uh, buffer crop or the the switchgrass, I guess we're running into that time of year where seeding is gonna be happening pretty much any day from my understanding. Um, and what that turns into, luckily that, you know, the odd fellows have done a great job of going down there and cultivating the old farmland. And mm -hmm. Trina, I'm sure you've seen that. They've done that every two weeks. Um, and so we have all this bare soil and we have a one acre butterfly garden and we have a buffer crop and a bunch of other uh, land that I guess we're pr proposing to put grass seed in at this point and possibly some trails. I think what we're running into is how are we going to get all those projects done this year and who specifically is going to complete those projects. Um, since this project has kind of evolved throughout the year, I don't know how much money was put into the DPW budget to suddenly start, you know, putting money into gravel for trails or grass seed, etc. But if we don't get the entire cultivated area seeded this fall, we're going to have a butterfly garden next year with weeds next to it. So I think that's the first thing that we really have to kind of address and then also come up with, I think the city council needs to verify or approve some sort of a master plan idea for the area. Um, and so we can kind of assign who's responsible for doing which portions of it or if we're looking for more partners, uh, et cetera, in the future that there are things that, that people can participate in. So, um, I know that we approved a site plan along with the MOU and I think this version that we have in the packet here has evolved a little bit since the last time we saw that and it includes certain things like a canoe kayak launch. Um, the Odd Fellows have expressed some interest in trying to do some shoreline cleanup by removal of trees, etc. Um, those are things that I think are going to need to be, you know, we're going to need to establish a timeline for it if, if that's something the council wants to see. We approve that in, in, a, in a master site plan, and then we say, okay, here, the Odd Fellows are going to take care of this amenity, they're gonna fundraise, they're going to take care of that, and then we can kind of manage it that way. But I think, um, I know I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now because this is something we've talked about for years. We've got the field cultivated, and this is the first step, but I think there's a lot of ideas that are floating out there, but we don't really know who's gonna be managing which amenity or which portion of the park at this, at this point, so. Matt wanted to bring it back here and I thought we should bring it back and have some council discussion, but I think Matt's got it laid out here perfectly. I mean, we, I think we need to determine the site layout uh, and I think what we need to do is kind of keep that, keep that to the, the field that we're dealing with right now, which would be to the, I guess, the north of the wastewater treatment plant um, and try to break this whole project up into phases so we don't become overwhelmed. Um, the timing issue, I think, you know, we should break things out into phases as they come up, but right now the, the seeding is the biggest timing mm -hmm. issue that we have. Um, developing a budget, I think the odd fellows want to have some idea of what things may cost, like if they were going to buy gravel through the, you know, our vendor or whatever, if they were mm -hmm. going to volunteer to uh, to put in the paths, things like that. So some of the stuff can be further out, but some of the things we need to, I think, pin down right now uh, and then find out what we want to do to formalize them, whether it's an updating an MOU with them or just kind of having our master plan and then having them agree to take care of those certain amenities or projects within the park itself. Any questions? <clears throat> yep. Would it be uh, fair to say that like right now we get the seating done somehow, some way we get the funds from DPW or whatever, but then would it be beneficial to put the paths in now or can that wait until like spring? I, I'm not a park builder. Um, oh, okay. Well, I, know. I, I think the problem that we'll run into, I'm, I'm assuming that grass seed is fairly inexpensive. That's just my assumption, yeah. I, I, but I don't know that. 
they're they're getting a special planting machine in to plant the uh, the butterfly garden, and so and Patrick can speak to this. He's probably got more detail, but I believe that one of their members works for the DNR and has some sort of access to this machine. So when they plant that, I believe they're going to plant the the switchgrass to prevent erosion, which leaves the blank space in between. Um, they haven't said that they wouldn't plant the grass seed. I guess. Uh, you know, maybe we can communicate with them, but someone's going to have to plant it at the same time as the rest of the mm -hmm. the butterfly garden and the switchgrass to prevent erosion. I don't know any cost on gravel or putting uh, tra trails in, but I just think that's probably going to be a bigger project than we can just kind of throw out at Zach, who's not going to be here in two weeks. Again, those are other things to consider. Mm -hmm. My thought is that if we just get something to cover to prevent weeds, we could come back in, in the spring, and by then we would have enough conversation with either the odd fellows or another group to say, here, how wide are the paths going to be? We, we haven't talked about that yet. There's a lot of details I think we need to hammer out. So, <clears throat> I like your idea, Mayor, of uh, just trying to get the grass figured out and... Um going from there um, with a lot of uncertainty surrounding uh, just where the path should go what um, and how wide that kind of thing so I'm in agreement with that if we could uh, I guess so they've committed to planting obviously the butterfly garden and the buffer strip of switchgrass um, I guess are you suggesting that we ask them if they would plant the grass too if we provided the grass seed or are you at or or i i don't really know i mean i think it's up to the council is that something that you feel that the city should be responsible for i i, I guess you know the one favor that they did do us is they cultivated the entire site sure. they could have just cultivated the one acre where the butterfly mm -hmm. garden is and i think that's where it's kind of started opening up some some vision for hey we could do this or we could do this so um the other i i'm just curious too i mean if we're going to be planting grass there are we going to send you know dpw out there to water it i mean to seed the grass seed for the next i mean unless if you have a week like last week we might have to water it but um and i that, that yeah, those are things that i feel like that's if we, what i feel like yeah, yeah if we can tap Zach before he leaves for his knowledge or if there's other people at the DPW that can help advise us I maybe we don't want to put mowed grass in there I don't know we haven't had that conversation my, my concern was um, we haven't mowed grass down there before in that field and now we have a mowable area which will you know obviously require us to continue mowing that mm -hmm. maybe it's just a grass establishing a grass that's temporary that prevents erosion to allow the butterfly garden to kind of emerge next spring and the switch grass to emerge and maybe we consider some alternatives I, I don't know Trina low maintenance is preferred usually. <laughs> well um yeah I guess our very first goal would be to get um areas staked out to define the grass area from the butterfly gardens so that the odd fellows know where to put their butterfly seeds um I'm guessing our last item to get to would probably be the gravel paths I think we'll have a better idea once all the seeding is established to figure out exactly where the paths should go, and it might just be a little headache ahead of time to have paths in the way. Uh, for gravel, I mean, I paid $50 a ton for, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, getting in town, uh, and the tons never go quite as far as you want them to. <laughs> Um, we'll have to get advice on how thick we need the gravel path to be to prevent, you know, mm -hmm. uh, more grass from growing through and from it sinking down into the ground. Because I've had that kind of fun also, where the gravel just disappears. <laughs> um, yeah, my main goal is just getting ahead of the weeds and getting seeds in as soon as possible. So I'm curious about... Um, Exploring other alternatives than than the grass for the mowed areas. I don't know. I'm not um, really that into plants and things, but I know that there are ground covers and and things that you know don't require as much maintenance over time. Um, I don't know how expensive those types of landscaping features are, but I'm curious also if we're 
you know, if we are installing potentially a gravel path and we have these mowed grass areas, are we wanting those areas for people to also walk on or I guess I, I guess I'm confused as to why we have a mowed grass strip in the center. I feel like if we are going to have a gravel path by the river, I feel like if we are going to spend money and maintain this grass that's in between the butterfly garden and the buffer strip, is it going to be grass or is it going to be mud for basically like a foot trail that goes all the way through the entire park? Um, but maybe looking into some other alternatives that don't need as much maintenance and mowing like ground covers um, uh, would be nice. Otherwise, you know, or eliminating that strip in between or I'm not sure what the, what the uh, plan was from the Odd Fellows with that 50-foot uh, strip in between. Maybe there's a reason for it that I don't know about. But um, I'm not particularly against it. I just... I, I don't, I don't know its specific purpose or if it has one or how to maintain that. Maybe Patrick can help. Patrick, did you have any? Um, do you have any idea? What is there a reason specifically why there's a 50 uh, foot strip in between the butterfly garden and the switchgrass? Yeah, um, I believe the concept there is just. Uh, Eventually, what we'd like to see is uh, ability for patrons and users of the park to go in there, walk between, and to be able to view the, the garden, you know, from different angles and perspectives. Um, but also, uh, there's the thought to having um, educational signage that could go along that trail um, that could explain the potential species that will be present with the plantings and the different types of plantings that are in the garden. So uh, that's my best understanding of what that grow uh, mode uh, strip is for. So. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. So it is kind of a walkthrough or sort of another trail There's style of it. I, I guess right. I'm just yeah. concerned of is the mowed grass really the perfect option of, of you know what to have there as opposed to having I don't know uh, some kind of ground cover or like even uh, a stone path a rock path um, something um, I think the stone path or the rock then would be um, difficult for our runoff purposes you know you, you want it to be more grass or pervious so the water is not going to sheet flow off of it and, and potentially um, contaminate something else. So I, I, I get the reason why they want to do the grass. And, and frankly, I like it sort of like a, a park a park around the park, you know, like with signage and bringing education into it. I, I think that's a great idea. Okay. Mike McCabe. Uh, I just had a question. Does the, I don't know, maybe nobody knows, does the DPW take care of the grass in the wastewater plant or do they do that themselves? I believe the wastewater treatment plant staff uh, kind of care for their own grounds. Well, um, I, we need some <laughs> direction here uh, this evening. So we need to be able to give staff uh, good what? ideas to what to start first. Trina. Oh, the other thing I wanted to ask about um, where it mentions uh, the existing trees and bush, and I thought they had said something about possibly cleaning up the tree area, and I wasn't sure how many they were thinking of removing and how that would probably um, uh, shake out. Matt, did you want, or Mayor Tom, go ahead. I, when I met down uh, on site with them, the, there's several box elder trees, large box elders that I think they wanted to remove. Um, I think what what Matt and I talked about was having them kind of identify potential trees for removal. Their concern, and, 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 and I think they were trying to get this done before fall, is because when the box elders dropped their seeds, they were concerned that they were going to get mixed in with the new plantings. Um, so I don't know that they can that they can achieve that and get that done by this fall. Um, but but having a formal agreement also, if they're going to be 
taking trees down on city property that we need to have some sort of agreement to make sure that we have everybody covered for liability etc and then also maybe I think they were suggesting a partnership that if they took the trees down that could they leave them and have w or dpw crews kind of come in you know and chip them up or remove them etc so there's uh, potential use of city resources in there and, and, and a partnership it seems like that the last time we met that they were okay with maybe just working on the tree issue later on maybe that could even be done during the winter uh, you know that that's a possibility of pushing it out and just uh, worrying about the seeds right now but i know that they have identified some good species of trees in there like wild cranberry wow. trees or something or whatever you know i i don't know but yeah yeah i don't know they, they felt they, having somebody from the dnr on the staff i think has helped identify the things they would like mm -hmm. to get rid of uh, i've been told that if they did take any trees down that they would take them down and leave the stump to make sure that the shoreline is still remains intact so it helps kind of tie everything yeah. together um yeah, there's there's other things in here, obviously, with the canoe kayak launch, which which I think is probably pretty far off and would require a lot of um, work between the DNR and the city to try to have a project like that come to fruition. But on the seating itself, I'm not um, I'm not sure if there's a recommendation outside of a regular park type lawn seed that that is cheap or or will achieve the same thing. But to me, it is just preventing erosion until everything starts growing and then reevaluating the uh, the trailer the trail system i guess potential trail system <clears throat> yeah yeah um uh, with anything they cut down as michael uh mentioned that you know if they gave us a plan what, what was being removed uh, there are shoreland zoning uh, regulations which are in effect for anything within 300 feet of a of a river um obviously this site being uh within 300 feet of a river so uh, there's limitations of what you can remove but anything like uh, dead or di uh, diseased can be removed immediately they don't really need my approval to do it um, it's just making sure and, and this is something being that um, I haven't had to enforce this part of our code too often or um, um, I need a little bit more clarity on how much so I can say oh this looks like it meets their code so I mean it's something that I think we need to work through and, and uh, They've shown a willingness to, to work with us on that. And I think once we kind of know to the extent of what's being cut, um, and I do think the leaving the stumps makes um, a lot of sense just for the erosion control factors that the roots would yeah, help prevent uh, any sort of erosion, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, so do we just give direction then to look for a um, sort of ground cover that's very inexpensive like a like a grass just something as the mayor state called temporary um, until we can uh, try to figure out what we would like a more permanently in the spring or should we just take advantage of the tilled fields right now and just go ahead with their recommendation of grass um, and do we want to ask them to plant it while they are planting their other plantings or would we like to um, have DPW plant it for us. Mayor Tom. Uh, Patrick, while we have you on, I'll just ask you, do you know if you've established a plant date yet? I know it seemed like it was coming up pretty quick. I, I am afraid I don't know exactly, um, but right, I, I just keep hearing fall. <laughs> so, um, and, and we're right in the midst of fall, so. And it, it largely depends on um, a couple of our members that have the, the equipment and the know-how um, to get in there and do that. Actually, um, I believe there's some work yet to do in the, the tilled area to clear out some, some material before they go in to seed. So there's going to be a work day, I think, for the lodge to get in there yet. So I think it's coming, but I don't think it's imminent. Um, so I would say maybe within the next month, it would be my best guess. Okay, that helps. Um, I, I think they have a specialized planter that you're using for the butterfly garden. That's my understanding, Patrick. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a deep cedar machine or something that, you know, you don't have to really disturb, I think, the soil as much as you you plant, uh, you plant in deep, so it's ready to go, something like that. Okay. 
and that gets into above my pay grade. I don't know yeah. if they could even plant our grass seed with their right. seeder or not. Um, my my understanding is when they seed the field this year, they they won't have to water the field uh, that they're planting it, mm -hmm. so it's done, and then it should emerge in the spring. That's my mm -hmm. understanding. Yeah. I don't know if we have right. that luxury with grass seed, or if there is a grass seed we can put down, or something that's a, a suitable ground cover mm -hmm. to prevent the erosion and not have to worry about watering. That's something we're going to have to reach out to someone. Uh, I know Phil has some experience with landscaping at uh, uh, DPW, one of the staff members, or maybe Jenny or Zach mm -hmm. can give us a recommendation, but uh, I think that we're going to have to be prepared to to do something uh, at the same time that the odd fellows are planting their garden if they can't seed it for us. Well, okay, Pete. I, I would suggest just, why don't we just plan on planning, having DPW just plan it. And then, you know, if it comes down to it and the odd fellows want to do it and they can do it, great. If not, we got to back up. Trina? Oh, no, it was really the same thing for, um, going with DPW and going with our permanent grass mix and not thinking of having a temporary grass because that'll be such a mess and then we'd need to start uh, retilling again if we wanted to get rid of the old grass mm -hmm. for something mm -hmm. special. Mm -hmm. And I'm imagining we're probably just going to go with um, a standard, you know, sunny and shade mix um, the only other thing I, you know, would recommend looking into would be like a um, sheep fescue. I really like the grass over at Albert Gardens, and it was, um, I want to say like four or five inches was as tall as it got. And it just looks really like, almost like shag carpet. <laughs> sheep fescue? Yeah. Is that, is that a, like a low maintenance? Low if they don't, they don't mow it? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is a standard parks mix seed too, and I don't know what's in there, but that's, we'd have to find out what type of seed we can get and how quickly we can get it. Okay. Matt? So I, um, I just want to confirm this would come back to the uh, October 6th uh, council meeting. And at that point, council would approve the type of grass and the cost and where it's coming from in the budget presumably, or is that would this come back to the cow on the 20th? I mean, that seems like it would be. Um, I think we should put it on the cow and yeah, I. Okay, but I'll make this Zach's parting gift. <laughs> okay, perfect. Because <laughs> this is out of my, yeah, my league, perfect. but yeah. How about we put it on both agendas? Because I right. think we're going to have to continue the discussion of developing the site plan and talking about the other amenities. I mean, the seating is the, the most immediate uh, timing concern that we have, but talking about some of the other information that's in here, I, I do. I've talked to Matt a little bit about uh, developing kind of a maybe just an overhead Google Map picture, and then just start naming amenities and numbering them on the map, and then we know okay, the city's going to do this, the Odd Fellows are going to do this. There may be other partners out there. I did talk to someone from the school this week, and nothing is official. But as we were discussing earlier with the. Uh, facilities use agreement, I do think there's going to be a desire uh, in the future for the school to m potentially want to have an area down there for maybe some agricultural uses, uh, maybe through the FFA or the, the DCS children, nothing specific, but none of that is, we don't know how much they would want, but I think the educational component we're trying to incorporate into there, it would make sense to have a placeholder for the school district uh, kind of in the master plan. So. Sure. <clears throat> I've been communicating with Patrick very well the last couple of weeks, so I think after this meeting, um, Matt and I can get together, uh, get our heads together, and I can continue to communicate with Patrick if we find the, the planting date that they've got planned for seeding down there and see what we can kind of cobble together on our side yeah. and, and maybe just get yeah, things absolutely. get things staked out down there so we all know we're not uh, tripping over each other. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us, Patrick. Thank you. This is very helpful for us. So I'll carry back the, the message and we'll keep uh, moving forward. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Matt, as well. Yeah, thanks, Patrick, and to the Odd Fellows for all the work that yes. they've put in down on that site. Thank you. We appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. Okay, so we can move on now. We have scratch number 16, so we'll move on to number 17. Uh, review and discuss administrators. Preliminary 2021 budget. 
All right, uh, so each of you has quite a bit of paper in front of you. Um, uh, Ian, I also did send it to your email. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to see it yet, so you should have everything that uh, the council has uh, in front of them tonight. Um, there's a big stapled packet, which is the 54 pages of the budget. Um, behind that, there's some uh, numbers I'm going to talk through about uh, the levy and uh, the increases uh, year over year, things like that. Um, a listing of proposed carryover items uh, going from the 2020 to 2021 budget, as well as uh, four capital expense items uh, that I want to talk through just very briefly. The goal of this, I don't think, is to be exhaustive. Um, this is a very quick introductory uh, look at it. I think I'm going to point out a number of items through here that I think are worth noting. And then I think each of you will probably spend time going through it, um, you know, page by page, maybe line by line or group by group. Uh, and as you come up with questions, let me know and we'll talk through them. And then as things start to kind of form and we get more, um, you know, final numbers and things like that, it's going to start taking its shape more and more every time we talk about it. Um, so again, there's things right now we don't know. Uh, some of the insurance rates, even our, uh, our liability insurance rates, we don't know those yet, so we've had to guesstimate. I know that there's increases coming. Uh, they were nice enough to let us know that the experience of the last year has not been good, but they haven't told us how bad that is going to be for our rates. Uh, so we put some, some filler numbers in there. Um, also, the, the state aids, we, we know some estimates of some. There's others that we don't know. We won't receive transportation estimates uh, probably till next month. Um, also, as we, you know, we're in the middle of a union contract negotiation that expires at the end of this year. And so a lot of the costs related to that aren't known right now. And additionally, there was a big change, um, a couple changes with uh, the TIF districts. Um, there was some value that rolled off that we, we knew was coming uh, for some equipment that had been misclassified by the assessor, I believe. Um, but then also we have uh, the TIF districts are really dependent on the mill rate. And coming off a full revaluation, which we don't even have our final values yet, uh, next week is Board of Review. So uh, they're coming shortly. Uh, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly what our TIF revenues and, uh, are going to be until we know the mill rates. And even when we know our mill rate and our assessed value, um, we're still waiting on the school and what their budget increases might mean with the referendum and how that will uh, uh, change everything. So there are built-in buffers um, for some things, but time is really going to tell uh, where we end up. Um, I took sort of a conservative... Um, approach to this initial uh, budget and so I think we're going to see that uh, you know there, there's going to be some changes and the council is probably going to ask for some changes as we go through uh, the budget process. Again being conservative uh, this is planned with the general employees um, uh, planning for a 1% wage increase just not knowing what the next year is going to hold. Um, uh, when I say the general employees, there's also other employees like the police union. They'll have their own contractual rates. Uh, the library board sets their uh, salary rates and increases. And uh, the court and other um, groups have authority to kind of you know, set their own destiny budget-wise. Um, uh, this also does include the DNR forestry grant. It includes the revenue and the expenses to accomplish that. Um, but, you know, things that we don't even know about, like as we talked about butterfly garden and expenses, those aren't built into here yet. And so as we move forward, we're going to have to get that list of things we want to accomplish but might not already be built in. And then as you look through it, you're probably going to notice there's some formatting and just cleaning up that needs to happen. Uh, it was uh, sort of uh, created from scratch over the last month or two. Um, and so... There's still a lot of cleaning up, and uh, there's even new account numbers and things that have to be assigned. So you might see um, a new uh, item in there that hasn't previously been in the budget, and there's no account number because it's not in the system yet. It won't be until later this year. Um, so I'm just going to go through. The pages are numbered. Um, we're not going to go through page by page. Like I mentioned, on page 3, I talked about, uh, and we'll be detailing the carry-forward um, amounts. Um, uh, that's down about um, 110,000 from last year. I'm really trying to focus the 
the amounts that we carry forward to have a, a purpose. And then, you know, when the, my goal would be when a budget year is done, the budget authority terminates. And if there's still a need for something, you budget in the next year for that and hopefully get away from uh, carrying over large amounts year over year. Um, on page 16, and again, I'm really going mm -hmm. through here quickly. There's a lot of information that is going to take a lot of time to go through. And so um, I think it's better to hit the highlights. So uh, uh, page 16, the library budget, um, uh, they're asking for a $1,100 increase, um, which is less than the increase from uh, 2019 to 20. Um, I know that they've had some uh, reductions in the county funding and had to scramble. Uh, but at this point, it uh, hopefully will end up with uh, a limited general fund increased contribution. Um, additionally, on page uh, 19, the Aquatic Center, um, this year's budget was nearly 130,000, and next year's proposed budget is less than 112,000, down $18,000 on the city contribution, which frees up a lot of space uh, to use those tax dollars in other places. So that's a, a huge change in their budget and really has an impact on the overall budget. Um, on page 21, the room tax, uh, I don't have a lot of detail on that except to say what we're seeing is generally a depressed demand for rooms and therefore the room tax, mm -hmm. uh, we're planning for a significant decrease. Um, and as we get more information, you know, we may have to decide if that's even enough of an increase or if we go further down from there. Uh, on page 25, that's one that we will probably have to talk about more. Um, it's the Solid Waste and Recycling Fund. And it's it, it typically it appears that we build up a fund balance and then we do run a deficit for a number of years until the fund balance drops to a point where you don't have more than uh, a one month's revenue available. And so uh, we're looking just preliminarily at a deficit of $20,000 in the annual uh, allocation and that's going to drop the fund balance down to below that one month so we're likely going to have to have a conversation um, about either uh, evaluating our expenses or more likely evaluating revenue and and seeing what um, increase in revenue could be gained um, in the the trash collection and recycling collection um, being cognizant that you know those are those are coming out of people's pockets but also there is an increase in the contract cost for us every year as well um, uh, page 32 the tourism commission again i'm just pointing out that uh, the tourism commission is going to suffer with the decreased room tax um, and so just an observation that they're going to be in a little bit of a difficult situation as the revenues dry up a little bit in the short term, but I believe you know there's some fund balance available. When it looks like things are on the the upswing, I think they could take advantage and you know potentially uh, have deficit budgets where you spend more than you're taking in, recognizing that now's the time to kick in when uh, the recovery is really strong and people are traveling and uh, tourism is increasing. Um, on page 35, this is one I think many of you got an email about uh, with the uh, uh, the municipal court budget. Uh, the There was a lot of points in, in the email from uh, the judge, and I really wanted to point out uh, two numbers. Um, one, uh, the judge, I think, pointed out that there was a, a $17,000 drop in the uh, levy, or the court subsidy that comes from the tax levy, which is, is a, a great achievement um, but I think to put it in context when you look down towards the uh, bottom the, the third expense line from the bottom the amount of money that the court is paying to the city dropped by 30,000 so while they saved 17 we lost 30 um, in revenue to the city and so the the general fund took a $13,000 additional loss uh, with that um, and I think it's worth noting that the payments to the city don't cover the subsidy. Um, so uh, the, the fine revenue won't even cover the money that we're putting in on the front end uh, is the plan. And I think uh, they also, uh, we went with a 1% uh, kind of planning 
uh, for the budget, I believe they've asked for a one and a half percent increase on their wages. Um, moving through again to page uh, 43, I, I mentioned that the, the, the TIF districts are basically kind of in a state of flux without having um, a lot of the information out there about the, the true assessed value and what the mill rates are going to be. This is the, the district that had about a 30% loss in value year over year because there was a substantial amount of um, uh, value that was misstated previously. And, uh, and so we knew it was coming, uh, just happened to uh, be in this year. And what that's going to do is that's going to drop the incre increment significantly. Um, and so with the, the drop in increment, uh, there will be some corresponding drop again in the, um, the incentive payments. But it's really hard at this point to, with all those moving parts and pieces, we can't say with certainty where we're going to end up. So that is something that's definitely uh, much more information to come forward on that one. Uh, but that TIF district is r right now uh, projected at a deficit, but I don't think it's going to end up being that level of deficit, but I don't know that it's going to completely turn to be a positive. So uh, each of the other TIF districts is showing um, a surplus. All right. Uh, page 47. Um, this is uh, basically the, the capital spending that we're proposing doing, and it's a, a, a fairly stripped down version uh, for this year. Um, one of the pages I have has some dotted and dashed lines on it, and it talks about the, the capital expenses that were proposed for the next year. Um, uh, from uh, Public Works, uh, there's only four items that we're talking about uh, entirely at this point. Uh, there's a plow and wing for the 2019 end loader, and that was about forty thousand um, dollars. That did not make it in this budget, but I have some options I'd like to circle back around here after I'm done with this list about maybe completing that purchase this year and avoiding having to rent the tractor and, and things like that, and accomplish that in current year budget uh, versus moving forward to a future year. Um, uh, the DPW would like to buy uh, Columbus Water and Light's used bucket truck that uh, they're going to be replacing in the next year. Um, they've offered it at $45,000. Uh, they would accept payments uh, at $15,000 a year for three years. Um, I do have that accommodated in this budget uh, at $15,000 a year. And that would be in the capital project equipment purchases line. Um, there's also a 1994 mini dump. This is um, sort of the, the mini dump truck. It's got a plow, they salt with it as well. Uh, but it is very old and there are some things that are rusting through on the bed. The rails are popping through and it's, uh, it's you know, I think Zach has said it's, it's served its life pretty well. Um, unfortunately, if it was just the pickup, it wouldn't be that bad of a uh, expense. Uh, but when you put on the, the dump mechanism and make sure it has the suspension plus the plow, uh, plus the salter and things like that, uh, it gets up over $70,000. Um, at this point, I didn't find room for it in this version of the budget, um, but as things change, there might be some more capacity and the, the council could look at where we are in the proposed spending and the proposed mill rate and say that there is some room in there, even if we take you know half a chunk this year and half a chunk uh, in the next budget year and say, you know, we might not be able to buy it in 21, but if we can set aside half of it, maybe we buy it in 22. So um, I think there's still options, but that is not included in the budget I have. Um, and then a landscape trailer, and essentially they have a two station landscape trailer, so they can take two of their three lawnmowers when they go mow parks. Um, unfortunately, that means the other one either has to drive the entire way on lawnmower tires um, while we're paying them, um, or there has to be a second trip with the trailer to get the one remaining uh, lawnmower and bring it out to whatever park they're mowing in. Um, for $6,500, they proposed to get a three-station um, uh, trailer and that they'd be able to take all the lawnmowers completely at one time without having to either drive one separately or do multiple trips. Um, that did make it in this budget as well. That's in the capital project line along with the um, uh, one third of the water and light bucket truck. Um, so 
So those are the only things that are showing up in this budget. So the one thing that I did talk about was the plow and wing for the 2019 end loader. And apparently in this year's budget, there was $12,500 put into the budget to help accomplish that, uh, which doesn't fund the full thing. But um, Zach had mentioned that we could carry the 12500 forward to next year. Um, you know, I think actually with the contingency funds we have available and some funds that there might be in other public works areas, uh, we could combine those to potentially do that this fall. And then we don't have to worry about doing it in the future. We don't have to worry about renting any kind of equipment or tractors or anything else for snow removal. And we would just get that done and uh, move forward. I also understand that we have an old uh, plow and wing that can be sold and could bring in some extra uh, revenue that way that would go to the surplus um, equipment account or the uh, account not specific to DPW. But um, so, if, you know, as we talk through this, if the council would like to see a proposal where we try to accomplish it this year with existing funds, um, I would be ready to bring that forward at the next meeting uh, if there's interest in that. I would care to see that just in how it would all work out. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, the, the final thing, it, you know, 50, page 52, getting right towards the end, um, that's the end of the wastewater budget. And, uh, you know, last year there was a surplus of uh, 23000 This year we're down to 19000 And I just want to point out that we're still running a surplus, but that, that surplus is narrowing. And there is a, a rate study going on right now. Uh, none of the rate study... Um, is accommodated in here because I don't know what they're proposing for new rates. So um, that might be something that we have to focus on again in the future. Um, then I wanted to finish just going over the attachments that I have. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times I think when we talk about the budget and the taxes, everyone wants to hear what's the mill rate and what's, you know, this is all preliminary. So you really can't bank on this. It's going to change. I can almost guarantee that, that it's anything but what the actual numbers are going to be. Um, but it's a simple demonstration on this 9-15-2020 uh, draft uh, showing the 2020 budget numbers, and that's tax levy um, budget numbers, and showing that last year uh, what our tax levy was at uh, about $3.35 million dollars. And the proposed budget that you have is about $3.4 million. Uh, it's a total increase, as you see, a printed of, of about $56,714, which is just a hair under 1.7% increase year over year on the, uh, the, the total levy. Our net new construction was just over 1.7. So at, at the area we're at right now, we should actually see... Um, two things going into the, the mill rate reduction. One is that uh, with the new assessment values, the, uh, the mill rate's going to drop by more than 13%, uh, just based on what you had before and saying now it's worth more. Again, doesn't increase your taxes. It just uh, changes the share of how the taxes are divvied up. Um, so we're going to have a natural reduction there um, uh, going from a mill rate uh, before any credits or um, deductions. In 2020, uh, you were up to like one or 8.79, and in 2021, as it sits, it's 7.62. So again, a natural drop. A lot of that isn't a drop in taxes at all. Um, but when you pair it with the new construction being higher than the rate of levy increase, there will be an additional roll-off as it's printed now. Um, also, that means there is slightly more room uh, potentially to uh, add tax revenue without increasing the overall tax burden on the community. Um, and then the other, the other sheet is just a list, basically, of what I'm proposing right now to carry forward. It's a pretty short list. Um, there were some senior center uh, funds that were donated by the Lions Club and the Columbus Area Endowment. Uh, they're proposing moving those forward. They weren't able to accomplish the expenses this year. Um, and then a variety of things uh, with the police department. Uh, they weren't able to have their national night out. They proposed carrying those forward. Um, uh, codification has not happened this year, so I think um, a lot of those funds could be carried forward, and I did increase it 
in next year's budget because I think we probably have a lot of ordinance cleanup to do and so I, I put a little extra money in that uh, but would propose carrying this forward uh, to help fund that uh, training for the administrator treasurer and clerk it's been very very limited this year and I think we're running out of time to have training so COVID played a lot of this and if we can carry those over uh, that helps us meet our budget goal um, and then the other one that wouldn't have an effect on the general fund would be uh, the cemetery monument repairs. I believe the inmates come in and do some work um, and with COVID they did not come out this year. So I uh, would propose to carry that forward to do the repairs in uh, the next budget year. So that's my very, very preliminary, very early, a uh, lot of information for you. Um, does anyone have any questions now? I, I do sort of envision this being a more, uh, you know, ongoing conversation throughout several future meetings. So <clears throat> have we um, nailed down all the dates for those future meetings? Um, I can't recall. I don't have my calendar with me this evening. I apologize. But did we want to recap those extra budget meetings and so council members can... Yeah, so all, everything I uh, proposed in my uh, preliminary um, uh, kind of timeline mm -hmm. coincided with regular meetings. So okay. if there's a need for additional budget meetings where we really want to dive in and um, if there's a desire to really spend, you know, a night going through a couple funds or something like that, we have the opportunity to do it. Um, you know, I think that uh, the, the list of things that were asked for and not received is is almost non-existent honestly the department heads were all uh you know very modest in their their asks and uh, basically all of them except for the capital purchases have been accommodated um so um you know if we can do that there shouldn't be a lot of need for uh, departments to come in and say well i really want xyz when if they asked for it in the budget it, it's there generally um and i think there was you know when you look at the fire department and things like that, you're going to see some increases in the um, in equipment repair because they've had some large equipment repair expenses and we're running over budget generally on that area. So um, it's really up to the council's level of com comfort on how they want to proceed. For some reason, I thought we had scheduled two additional meetings. Maybe I'm, I, I, clearly I'm imagining things. I'm sorry, but um, if if. If we can make it through it in, during a regular meetings time, that's that's totally fine with me. But if at any point, if anybody, I just wanted to point it out to council, if anybody wants to dive in deeper to a subject, don't feel that you can't bring that up um, or suggest that we have a special meeting if you're confused on a subject or um, you think that we should spend some more time on it throughout the budget process. Is the uh the amount that you have here for the levy increase is that assuming uh, taking the uh, the full available levy increase based upon our net new construction? Uh, it'd be awfully close. Okay. Um, and so that's one of those things until we actually get their sheet and it's down to the uh, hundredth of a percent of increase and then uh, any adjustments that they have. Um, generally, when we get to that point, whether it's the right way or wrong way to do it, if your goal is to take every penny of levy you can, uh, that's when you do the final tweaks and say, well, we'll add X number of dollars or take X number of dollars from, say, the contingency fund. And that could be your balancing line to say, there's 400 more dollars out there and we have to take it or we risk losing it in the future. So um, that's sort of a back check that happens later on. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. And thanks for all the work. I know that you've put a lot of effort and a lot of time into this uh for the last couple of weeks trying to get ready for this. Uh, I know you probably worked all weekend, but you're trying to build some of this stuff from scratch and you've done an excellent job of putting together a, a draft budget. I appreciate all the work, Kyle. Further questions from council? Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, um, looks like we are going to move on. Um, we're going to move on to, let me make sure I read the right, correct one here. Um, move on to number, I believe it's number 19. Do I have the updated one? 18. Convene to close session for state statute 19.85 sub 1 sub G to confer with 
legal counsel for the governmental body who is rendering oral or written advice concerning strategy to be adopted by the body with respect to litigation in which it is likely to become involved. I'll need a motion to go into closed session. Alder Pipe will make a motion to convene into closed session. Okay, seconds. Okay, I have a motion and a second to move into closed session. Pat, would you please take the roll? Gray. Aye. McCabe. Aye. Piperone. Aye. Reed. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Tome. Aye. Adams. Aye. Motion carries. We are now in closed session. Just one quick thing. I have not received a link for a closed session meeting. 